uh, Scotty Bob um, or Robert Morgan. Um, those, the, the, uh, if you're a wingsuiter, he doesn't need uh, much of an introduction, um, uh, both as a skydiver and a base jumper. But today, obviously, we'll be focusing on, on skydiving. He travels the world, and today he's joining us from uh, Stockholm in Sweden. Um, he's a man who's truly passionate about teaching wings, wingsuiting progression. Um, he's a squirrel athlete and also a next level instructor, just to name a few things. Um, um, but uh, and Scotty will today talk about um, different tools for different clients in wingsuiting. Um, and I won't waste more uh, of your time, Scotty. Um, over to you. Thanks, Gerald. Hey, uh, how's it going, everybody? Uh, yeah, coming at you from uh, Stockholm, Sweden. I'm here in the wingsuit tunnel uh, here. It's a pretty incredible tool we got here going for us here in uh, Sweden. It's pretty brand new. Um, but yeah, I'll start kicking this off. Let me know if the share screen starts working for you. All right, is that working? Does everybody see that? Yep. Cool. Awesome. Um, just want to start off a little bit of a background about myself. Um, my name's uh, Robert Morgan. Scotty Bob, I was a, I'm a wingsuit instructor at Scott of Elsinore, uh, part of the greater Southern California area. We got quite a few drop zones. We're pretty busy, so we travel a little bit. Uh, also for next level uh, travel, obviously, the last two years has been kind of clamped down, uh, especially on the next level side, but uh, we're looking forward to getting going again. Uh, I started jumping in the U.S. military, uh, U.S. Marine Corps on the round parachutes. I uh, went to airborne school in 2007. Um, Started sports skydiving in 2009, started base jumping also in 2009. So my progression is a little bit weird, <laughs> much like a lot of people's. Uh, started wing shooting in 2010. Uh, I have 9,500 sports skydives, 3,100 base jumps, been active for about 40, uh, 14 years. Uh, I had a tandem rating, uh, skydive tandem rating for a little while there, uh, coach rating. I'm also a base instructor, my wife and I run a base school based out of the United States and Brazil, also a little bit in Europe, just started this year. Okay, <laughs> we'll start this off and kind of get into why wing suiters are so weird and complicated. It's, it's okay to admit it. Um, we are probably the weirdest discipline out there. Um, it's really one of the few disciplines that relate solely to the use of a tool rather than a physical action for relativity. Uh, you've got your belly jumpers, your free flyers, you've got uh, your crew guys, like they're pretty much all kind of coming together for a common, uh, a common trade that's not really the tool that they're using that defines them. Um, that being said, wingsuiting in that use of that tool, it's really diverse. Like we do a lot of stuff. We do free flying, we do belly relative stuff. We do, you know, as XRW, there's not a lot of these groups really agree all the time <laughs> so there's a lot of device there's a lot of divisiveness and uh, diverse skill sets kind of all going into one discipline um so you really the argument that we have at least at elsinore is you get three wing series in a room they'll find at least 12 things to argue about it's pretty much true um yeah we have performance flyers acro weekend fun jumpers big way like it's there's pretty much a grab bag of everything going on in there really kind of leads to a lot of arguments, a lot of drama, um, and not a lot when it comes to teaching progression and figuring out what people want to be and what they, what kind of gear they want to buy. You're going to get about 16 different answers from everybody. It depends on who you're asking is really what it gets down to. Um, on the base jumping side of the room, it's <laughs> turns into the thousand pound elephant in the room because uh, pretty much everybody's first experience seeing a wingsuit in the real world is through a base jumping video. Uh, that's how I saw it. A good chunk of every single student that comes through our schoolhouse uh, says they saw a wingsuit on a wingsuit base jumping video and that's what wanted to get them into it. So. Uh, once they kind of figure out that uh, that the first, if that's the first thing they say at the drop zone, everybody's like, oh, that guy's gonna die. So people start getting kind of scared to admit it. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Cool. Um, Wayne Street skydiving really in my lifetime, uh, at least from 2010 to 2016, uh, base jumpers have been the icons of the sport. Like, and uh, definitely in my case, 
uh, your top name guys that everybody looks up to wants to be LOs, wants to be boogie organizers, wants to be instructors. They're all, they're all base shovers. And uh, what we're really kind of slowly starting to see, especially over the last five to six years, uh, those guys, including myself for a good, good long while there, uh, had very little skydiving experience, maybe sometimes not the best judgment <laughs> in the world, uh, at least when it comes to progression and safety and, and making sure that the, the guys that are looking up to him are kind of following the same or following a good path that's going to keep them safe. Um, and it's really only been the last five to seven years that uh, wingsuit skydiving has kind of come out of the dark ages. It's, it's been really fun to see. Uh, myself, I came from a base jumping background and I've just gotten really hard and heavy into skydiving again in the last seven years. And it's, uh, it's really awesome. I've, I honestly have learned stuff that I thought I already mastered and really realized I knew nothing about. So I would say sky, on the skydiving side of things, those things have really changed over the last five to seven years. And some of those bigger factors, the three biggest ones really are way more focused beginner and intermediate training, um, focused on core concepts, making people better flyers in general. Just the mere fact that we're flying wingsuits to a lot of people is just kind of like mind blowing and oh my God, this is so crazy that they kind of don't really take the time to invest in some of those core concept training ideas, whether it be even before they put the wingsuit on or in those first one to two to three years about learning how to actually fly the things. That's, that's really changed in the last five years. It's something I'm pretty proud of to, to see. Uh, wingsuit specific main canopies are awesome. We'll, get, we'll kind of talk about more of those a little bit later. One of the biggest changes in the last five to seven years, the Epicenes, the Omicrons, the uh, Winxes, the Krakens, the, these new wingsuit canopies have changed the sport and uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, it's really reduced the chances of cutaways. Uh, and wingsuit design changes have made full-time less stressful. Um, the designs just keep getting better and better and better. It's a lot of one of the major reasons you see A, a lot less cutaways, B, a lot higher performance margins that you're seeing in modern day suits. Um, kind of one of the, <laughs> the downsides of all this like positives that we're just talking about is that the major, major killer for your high experience wingsuiters is it's, it has and it's gonna continue to be base jumping. Um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, a little bit more about focus training. What I would mean about focus training for beaters and intermediate flyers is, um, really comes down to some really core concepts that we, especially at Elsinore, as we get, I mean, we're doing 40 to 60 first flight courses a year. That's just me personally. I'd probably say we're teaching a hundred more or more new wings a year. So that's a lot of numbers of people coming through there. We have, we'll fill an otter on a good, on a Friday with just wing suiters. So we have a lot, but kind of building that kind of foundation up from the ground level really requires to focus in on what we're about to talk about here, which is basically it sounds real simple, but if you really focus in on your newer jumpers on it, it really is exits from different aircraft at different air speeds to avoid tail strikes, flying patterns, which is really harping on navigation, Approaching groups, which is really avoiding high-speed collisions, breakoffs in opening areas, avoiding canopy collisions with other traffic, uh, deceleration and body configuration change for poles, which is safe deployment speeds, emergency procedures and decision altitudes, and really landing with other canopy traffic, which is avoiding tandems and AFF. It's kind of a hot topic here at Scott of Elsinore or at my home drop zone. Cool. Really a little bit more about tail strikes. I don't know if you guys have had them uh, or had have seen a few of them in Australia. Uh, we've had quite a few high profile ones in the US. It's just my opinion that tail strikes are probably the biggest risk to our sport in general that we are currently facing. Uh, all it really takes is uh, an insurance company that insures our jump aircraft to kind of just decide like that the risk matrix isn't, risk matrix isn't good for them anymore and that they're just going to ban wing feet. So that's something that's kind of on our right radar. And when we train new jumpers, we really kind of, we want to know the why behind the what, not just do this, do this and do it every single time and you'll be okay. Cause that's not always the case. Uh, we really try to harp in and teach that wingsuiters need to be talking to pilots. Like pilots need to know that a wingsuiter generally has an idea with what's going on with the aircraft. What, what, what a stall speed of a jump aircraft is. You know, why can't I slow this aircraft down below 60 knots? 
you know, the, the new wingsuit pilot needs to know this and they need to know how to read instrument panels in a cockpit, primarily the airspeed indicator where the flaps are set. Uh, we teach this in first flight courses. We have spent an entire 20 minutes up in the front, you know, front of the aircraft, talking to a new wingsuiter and letting them know what the pilot is dealing with, not just what all the jumpers are telling them and they're yelling at him for ground speed and he doesn't even know how to look for that. That's kind of some general stuff that's helped us out in the Elsinore as well. They need to be way more knowledgeable of aircraft. Um, really, everybody needs to know how to effectively get out of different kinds of aircraft without presenting their chest to the relative wind. Um, this is easier or harder depending on your jump aircraft. The smaller the door, bigger the door, higher the airspeed of the aircraft. Um, just kind of a blanket statement of old school exits of closing our arm wings and and you know falling out of the aircraft or hopping up with our arm wings closed that doesn't really work so much anymore um it's really about how we're presenting our chest to the relative wind and making sure we're getting our arms back we're trying to exit with the relative wind not jumping out of the door um we've really been successful about at least at my home drop zone of getting rid of most of our tail strike problems but that's been a joint work with our pilots and our wing and our younger wingsuiters that don't have the experience yet. Uh, it's kind of a team effort. And uh, I highly recommend every drop zone out there, drop zone manager, pilot, whoever it is that if you're really worried about a tail strike, the, the answer is find whoever your most experienced wingsuit LO is a drop zone, bring all the wingsuiters into the fold and really get to know the aircraft that you're jumping and how, do you, how to safely exit that aircraft rather than just setting blanket rules that don't really work in every in every case because every aircraft is different uh and the students need to know that cool a little bit more about flying patterns and opening areas that uh <laughs> yeah it's kind of the joke that wing tutors are landing off the drop zone all the time um that should not be normal for multitudes of reasons one that you know every off landing is a chance for injury uh, really need to take that out of the normalized behavior for wingsuiters. You need to really make it hefty beer fines at Elsinore. I mean, we're talking 10 cases of beer if you're an LO and you lead a group off. Like, <laughs> or, I mean, even just making sure that the LOs know if they're leading groups off, they can get fired. Like, uh, individual jumpers, if they're just breaking off and going to different places, that's a sit down talk. But um, just making sure that people are landing on the drop zones is uh, that's really an LO and a beginner jumper issue. Um, each drop zone is a little bit different, uh, especially at wingsuit heavy drop zones like we have in uh, Scott of Elsinore. Uh, we split sides to uh, deconflict canopy traffic from wingsuit areas. We basically primarily send our beginner groups going west and then our tandems and AFS are hanging out on the east hand side. Um, we're also got wingsuiters pretty much on every single load. Uh, it's something that really works out well for us. Um, students really need to know how to fly this pattern before they start changing their pattern, doing 270s, start involving dynamic maneuvers into whatever they're doing. They need to kind of master that, a basic two turn left hand or right hand pattern, whatever it is, before they start messing around with it. Um, and our opening areas are not really set in stone as like, especially for drop zone managers, um, DZOs or, you know, SNTAs, they kind of we, they want to kind of put everything in a box and like, this is the way it is. And it's always going to be that way hundred percent of the time. Uh, for wing scooters, that's really going to change based on the upper winds, DZ activity, uh, what you, what's going on throughout the day. Like we, you really need to kind of go back to that chief, you know, you're, whoever your most experienced wingsuit pilot is and work out through the day. Like, Hey, like, why are wing scooters landing off? Well, like, where are you guys trying to fly to find your opening area? and really kind of change, make modifications to where that is. So A, we're not, we're making sure everybody's landing on the drop zone and B also making sure that uh, we're really deconflicting that canopy traffic with AFS tandems, uh, any of anybody else pulling high basically. Uh, and these newer jumpers really like every drop zone being different, they really need to know where they don't want to end up on a wingsuit. Like, like I said, when a lot of drop zones out east here in the US, if you go in a certain direction, you're pulling over a sea of trees, you have a cutaway, you're never going to find your canopy. So, you know, it's that may not be the best place that you want to send your beginners, your first flight courses out. Kind of have like the safest 
easiest pattern be the kind of the go-to. And if you have more experienced groups, you send them on the more technical patterns for the more technical open area, opening areas. At least that's what we do at Scott of Elsinore. Cool. Uh, a little bit about high-speed collisions here. Uh, massive hazard for beginner and intermediate jumpers. The most dangerous time for any wingsuit skydive is 10 seconds out the door. And that is not just for wingsuiters, that's for angle trackers, for a lot of free-flying groups. Uh, these are where your high-speed collisions happen almost 90% of the time. It's not you know, after the turns or going home, say about 90% of the time, it's instability out the door, inability to, or not knowing how to approach a formation cautiously and effectively. Uh, and that's really, we start harping in on that, especially once people get off of first flight courses, get more into more uh, bigger and bigger formations. Um, the real big one on this is making sure leaders are taking their groups away from jump run. This is like angle flying 101. Uh, we've learned a lot from angle flyers because angle flying and wingsuiting, at least nowadays, are pretty much the same thing. We're just wearing a dress. So <laughs> we, uh, we really want to keep those groups away from being under the plane. Never build your group underneath the plane. Uh, what If that group is going under the plane taking a right hand turn and, and flying to the east or in whatever direction it is that's going under the plane we're still building the group 10 to 15 degrees offset from the jump door and then building that group and then turning it away and off of jump run we're just allowing our group to get away from underneath the aircraft uh, again that's where some of our gnarliest collisions that we've seen at scott of elsinore has been paris a lot of these drop zones has been Group leader gets, you know, gets the group out of the aircraft, gets, you know, 10 seconds away from the door, doesn't really get off jump run, and somebody late in the plane gets out unstable and basically slices through the entire group. And that's where you're going to see those super high speed collisions that are potentially fatal. Um, really want to be keeping your group small with low experience levels. I know that sounds pretty, no, pretty common sense. Uh, we kind of take a common sense approach, like people are getting into three ways and four ways pretty early on, but once you start getting them bigger than four ways, it's it gets complicated. People need to know how to exit safely. People need to need to know how to approach, approach a group safely. And uh, they need to really keep that idea of that there's no lurking. It's not like I'm gonna build a three way and then have somebody chasing on the outside and not know where they are. Um, lurking is no longer a thing at, at our drop zone. Uh, you're either on the jump or you're not. We kind of take a more free fly approach to it. Um, if you cannot be there in the skydive, you are not on the skydive. And uh, as a discipline, I think wingsuiting is it's kind of going more that route rather than everybody trying to be friends and being like, yeah, buddy, you can be 40 feet away over that way and you're totally on the jump and it's okay. It's, it's not really okay anymore because we've seen too many high, really, really high speed collisions that kind of have messed a lot of people up. Cool, getting a little bit into break-offs. Um, larger group break-offs uh, should be lateral and vertical staged uh, with staged altitudes. We call it a meteor. Um, stealing that from Joe Webb, <laughs> if he's listening on here. Um, this is kind of a more of a, like a big way RW or a big way belly uh, group ideas that we're not really gonna be doing our, the classic just fanning out in a bunch of directions going away from the base is it doesn't really work once we get, especially when we start getting vertical stacks of back flyers and belly flyers going that can get up to 10 to 15 stacks high. Um, <clears throat> that lateral only break off does not work. Uh, having a much more vertical altitude stage break off where entire pods are kind of breaking off individually uh, based on altitudes really works way better. Uh, we've at you know, in Southern California, we're building up to, you know, 40 ways, working our way up to 50 ways at pretty high speed formations. So it's kind of stuff that we're really getting into the weeds about. Uh, how do we make bigger and bigger ways more safer? Um, break offs are really one of the more key things we're focusing in on. Uh, your LOs at your drop zone should know where to angle their groups to prevent uh, flying into other groups, but not only that, they should also kind of know where to point themselves. So when they have their groups starting to break off, they're not just fanning off out in the middle of nowhere or ending up downwind, having some of the, you know, if one half of your entire group that you just led landed off, it's because the LO did not point the group back in the right direction. Um, diving and pulling in place is not a break off. Um, we, <laughs> 
yeah, we had a, a long stint there, especially when people were going into learning how to flare uh, in wingsuits where their break off basically was just dive about a thousand feet straight down and then flare a ton and they're flaring right back into the group. So there is a lateral and a vertical component to all, all break offs, making sure that when people start doing big ways that they know that, that they need to get away from the base, they need to decrease AOA and then continue getting laterally away from base before they're actually starting to decelerate to pull. Um, one of the lower experience levels, like use of hand signals rather than leg kicks is kind of more old school. Um, I've literally seen students of mine that have completely gone wildly unstable right at pull time. And the reason why was because they said they were trying to wave off for pull by kicking their legs and we're like, don't do that. <laughs> like, please just use hand signals. Like we can use smaller inputs to let people know that we're breaking off or we're getting ready to pull. Cool. Deceleration and deployments is, uh, honestly, this is probably one of the more new age stuff that now that with wingsuits, we can actually flare, we can slow down. We, we have way more airspeed control, um, teaching students to early on that, that this is a better way to learn how to do things that, uh, that we're not only using a body configuration change by either arching or presenting our chest, um, but we're also using an angle of attack change to slow down and get ready for pull. Uh, this old school way of collapsing all wings and arching, it just doesn't work. Like and why we, the, our standpoint, especially at our schoolhouse is uh, if, if they're not gonna be able to do it on a more modern, a higher surface area wingsuit, then why would we teach it to them in a low surface, in a, you know, a small suit? So we've really kind of gone away from that idea that collapsing all their wings and then reaching back and arching the pull is not a good idea. Uh, on the inverse of that, a heavy de-arch at pull time, uh, we see a lot of issues that when people are just consistently missing their pulls in, in wingsuits is uh, it's either a very, very strong problem with a strong arch or it's a very strong de-arch. It's either one of the two. Uh, students are really coming back to pull and going to a full, almost reverse banana D arch to try to pull and they get highly unstable. Uh, it's also moving the position of their BOC uh, with the back of their rig. It actually moves it away from their back and they could spend a whole bunch of time. I've had one student that literally did that for 2000 feet and then just went straight to reserve. Um, knowing these body configuration times at deployment is really important. Um, people need to kind of realize what their body's doing when they're reaching back to the handle. Uh, just being in a wingsuit adds a little bit more technical difficulty to that and having an instructor or a coach being there videoing that they should really spend a lot of time at pull time in, uh, to show a student what's actually going on. Um, and what another big one for us that's really helped out is, you know, students really get stressed out at pull times and you need to tell them that it should take time. Uh, pull time should not last you know, two seconds, it should last five to five to eight, right? They should have time to breathe, relax, count, do whatever it takes to make sure that they're not going unstable. Um, we see a lot of students just rushing in at full time. Cool. Uh, one of the more hotter topics, especially in our drop zone, was uh, emergency procedures and uh, reminding new wing suitors about emergency procedures. Um, it seems everybody what second they put a wingsuit on, they kind of, a lot of this stuff from AFF goes right out the window. Um, they start forgetting decision altitudes. They start forgetting what they do just because they, they just flew a wingsuit for the first time or we have 10th time or whatever. Uh, wingsuit specific canopies have made this way safer. Um, our, our numbers of cutaways have gone, have basically gone to the floor because most of our wingsuiters are flying with wingsuit specific canopies. Um, MARDs have also made the sport safer. Uh, but the reality is, is when we start making these things safer, it's like every other discipline, I'm sure you guys could agree, people are going to start finding a way to make it more dangerous. They start pulling lower, uh, they start taking it to the basement. So reminding younger jumpers when they get that wingsuit specific canopy to, to not, not forget that, yeah, we still, if we end up with line twist and we pulled it 2,500 feet, we're kind of putting ourselves in a box. We need to start, especially when we start changing anything in our gear, or we're getting, putting a bigger wingsuit on, we need to start bumping our opening altitudes back up just a little bit. Um, with these wingsuit specific canopies, it, it kind of motivates you to pull a little bit lower, um, but that's definitely not the best way to go about things. Um, 
yeah, decision altitudes for for cutaways. We've had a, a pretty gnarly one at Scott of Elsinore not too long ago, about six months ago, where a, a newer wing suitor with probably about 50 wing suit jumps pulled a bunch of line twists and just had a cutaway about five or six jumps prior and then fought his line twist all the way to the ground and land in some lady's backyard and miraculously survived and was totally okay. But basically laying a line twist on a 130 size canopy and yeah, it was totally okay, but could have gone way worse. Um, decision altitudes are still a real thing. Like you need to drill in the students at a very young age. If you are not at a line twist, because they happen, you are cutting away at this altitude. Um, we've seen a couple bat gnarly ones here and there. Uh, leg wings should not be unzipped until you land your main canopy. We had a, a pretty gnarly accident where a leg wing interacted with a reserve pilot chute with a reserve bridle um, pretty recently. Uh, leg wings need to be staying on our on our bodies until we know we're laying, we're not going to have a cutaway. Uh, and really, if you can have, if you have somewhere at your drop zones to do some kind of line twist training, uh, beginner wing suitors have line twists. It's just reality, whether we're on a wingsuit specific canopy or not. Uh, they do end up with line twist. Instability at pull time is a real thing. And uh, if you can give them a level up to be able to know how they're properly going to get out of these line twists in a high stress environment, they're going to be able to perform way better when it actually does happen. Uh, yeah, and also just knowing where other people are in the skies. The uh, wingsuiters need to be aware of AFF and canopy and tandem canopy traffic. Um, that's, this is also a big one for LOs, like whatever your L lead, your load organizers for wing suiters are at your drop zone. Uh, they need to know where that canopy traffic is gonna be. Again, at, at wing suit heavy DZs, we, we make it really, we're friends with, I was a TI, you know, I know where these guys like to fly. I even talk to the TIs on the load. I'll be like, hey, are you guys gonna stay on the east hand side of the runway? Cool, I've got a group of five inexperienced wing suiters. We're gonna go west. That'll de-conflict that airspace really easily. Um, but these are conversations that are happening throughout the day. It's not something you just have in the morning and then you forget about it. Uh, you really kind of, especially with all horizontal moving groups, angle flying, tracking crew, like these, they, they're active conversations that happen throughout the day because things change. Uh, and we need, they need to be active conversations that are not just kind of set and forget through, you know, for the day or the weekend or the week. Um, blanket rules don't really help too much for this kind of stuff. They, it just, it's active diligence for everybody that's on the DZ trying to make sure everything is safe. Um, we typically have a favored landing area or opening area for wingsuiters at our drop zone. Uh, drop zone managers and wingsuiters can sit down and kind of figure this place out. Like, where do you want us to open? That's kind of the best question that a a wingsuit LO can ask to a SNTA or a drop zone manager, like where, where's the best place for us to end up so I can get my groups back to that area. Um, rather than kind of like just hoping by chance that wingsuiters end up where they're supposed to be because they probably won't. <laughs> um, they really need to make it as simple as possible for first flight courses. You got to dumb it down to the easiest, simplest stuff possible. Um, Tandem masters really should try to avoid certain areas of the sky. I know that kind of sounds, you know, like TI's got a lot going on, but uh, it's going to get way worse if you have a wings, you know, a first time wings here go by you under canopy that you weren't planning. So if you be like, let we, whoever the instructor is in the plane with that first time wing suitor, they should like look at the TI's on the load and be like, hey man, you know, where are you going to be? Are you going to open up and you're going to go east side of the runway? I got this guy. I'm going to keep him on the west side will kind of keep those away because the reality is the first time put somebody puts a wingsuit on, they don't really know where they're probably going to end up. So you want to create that horizontal space as much as possible. Um, Deconflicting wingsuits and tandem canopies in the landing areas is, uh, is a, a good idea for sure. Uh, especially for younger, your, some of your first fly, first time flyers, they're going to be pulling pretty high. They are going to be landing at the same time as the tandems. Um, so we just kind of deconflict. Like if you are landing at the same time as tandems, then you go and land in, in a different LZ. A lot of drop zones do that. I think it's a great idea. Um, it kind of pisses some of the wingsuiters off because they're not swooping the grass or doing, you know, looking cool in front of everybody. But 
cutting off tandems and seems to be a reoccurring problem everywhere you go as wingsuiting gets more popular. So if you just deconflict the drop, the landing areas, doesn't have to be by much, but have a different area that they're landing in that avoids canopy traffic up high and, you know, landing problems down low seems to work real well. Cool. Yeah. Our, the, the next biggest thing that's really helped us out that's made us way safer, uh, especially the last five years is wingsuit specific canopies. They are awesome. Uh, I can't say enough about them. Um, they've reduced our risk of cutaways down to very, very low. They still do happen. Um, but your, our chances of getting out of line twists are greatly increased when we have dropped the wing loading to like 1.5. And we're on low aspect ratio, seven cell, mostly F-111 canopies. We're basically turning our skydiving canopies into base canopies. Um, we want low performing wings that open great, maybe don't have the best glide ratio possible, maybe don't land the best, but you know, hey, they open great. That's what we're looking for. A wingsuit cutaway is way more dangerous than learning how to fly a seven cell. So that's the outlook that we look at it. I would rather teach somebody to be a better canopy pilot and reduce their chance of cutaways uh, rather than having them have potential for a cutaway on every single jump. So getting rid of nine cells, ZP parachutes, semi-elliptical parachutes out of the wingsuit realm has made us way safer. Uh, really good thing that we have is we've invested in a, in a demo fleet for our first flight courses. I think all wingsuit shoot schools should. If, you're at a drop zone that has a wingsuit school and you don't have a fleet of wingsuit specific canopies, you should get one. Um, they usually will come with D bags, pilot shoots, risers. So when a new, new person shows up at DZ and wants to be a wingsuiter, they have the opportunity to have that piece of gear with them. If they, you know, swallow the Kool-Aid and they, if that's what they want to do, they can buy it. Um, Mards are awesome as are well, uh, way better than RSLs. RSLs, in my opinion, are, are kind of like a really second cousin to to MARDs, your Skyhooks or your other manufacturer designated uh, MARDs out there, really good for wingsuiting. Whatever we can do to get that reserve activated a little bit faster is, is way better in my opinion. Uh, and your containers need to fit your people. Uh, that's kind of the newer thing that's kind of come more online is that people have skydiving containers that don't really fit them very well. It may be okay when they're just doing a belly jump or an angle jump. You can, they're kind of having a hard time at full time even then, but the second they put a wingsuit on, it becomes a really serious problem because the, either the container is too short or it's too long. If they bought it secondhand off somebody, uh, that can kind of turn into a bigger problem. So people, as they go into getting into their first flight course, they should really focus on container fit, make sure that thing actually fits them well. Uh, same thing as it's been for a long time, bridle lengths at eight feet minimum, good pilot shoots are kind of a must for anybody wanting to get into the sport. Uh, I really highly rec high recommend wingsuit schools getting them for sure. Uh, obviously AADs as well. Cool. Um, almost up finishing it up here, guys. Just, uh, yeah, the wingsuits these days, we have more power. Uh, more power equals more problems. Uh, manufacturer recommend recommendations for jump numbers for suits should be heated for sure. Uh, but what we've seen a lot more recently is that with students having becoming super current, super fast and jumping a lot in a short amount of time, uh, sometimes the kind of time versus currency in the sport kind of goes a little, it gets really vague, but uh, it is becoming more common for people to progress to bigger wingsuits quite quickly. Um, but really the focus is they need to be able to do everything in that suit that they possibly can before they should be upsizing in a suit. Uh, pull time should never be an issue on any suit upsize. Uh, if it is, they need to go back down a size. <laughs> that just goes without saying. Um, but really the newer, modern, more modern suits that have come online these days, pull time's actually kind of getting easier. Uh, so it's it's pretty awesome time to be, to be wingsuiting. Um, <clears throat> just finishing up and I'll open up the floor for questions here. Um, yeah, uh, everybody really kind of like a, going back to the beginning of this, my first experience with wing tooting was watching wing tooting base jumping videos. I, I am, a, I'm, I love it. It's part of my life. Uh, my wife and I teach it through our base jumping school. Uh, it is the biggest motivator to get into the sport for sure. 
it requires the most amount of time and discipline to do it safely. I mean, you're talking, you need to dedicate your life to this, to this activity to even think about it. So when you see a newer jumper at the drop zone, they want to get in a wingsuit, they want a wingsuit base jump. It shouldn't be shunned, but they just need to be made very well aware of the, of the amount of commitment that it takes to get to that point. Uh, all of us that have done this and do that and continue to do it, um, we really have dedicated our entire lives to it. So uh, your weekend warriors at the drop zone that maybe don't have the amount of time to do this, they should at least be made aware that, hey, like maybe, maybe you need to make some life changes to be able to do this, to make it, to get to that goal of jumping one of these things off a cliff. Um, the most dangerous years in wingsuit base jumping aren't the first, it's more the third and the fourth. Once you start getting more experience in this kind of activity and you come back to the drop zone, everything else kind of just seems safe and normal. And, you know, the weird starts to become normal. Um, really having a reality check on guys. We've, I've seen that a lot and I've kind of come full circle uh, myself is that, you know, just because you're flying around mountains in a, wing, in a wingsuit, you know, base jumping doesn't mean that, you know, you're special or you're a superhuman or something. You still can get messed up and die just like the rest of us. Uh, and everybody needs a reality check every once in a while. So it's, uh, it's something I do to myself constantly all the time. And I think as people start making this stuff more normal, then they, they need it as well, too. I try to make sure I, I reality check my buddies all the time. So cool. Uh, Charles, open up the floor to questions. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, I can, Scotty. We've already had three questions, so we'll we'll run through them, and if there's time, we can we can open the floor to to a few more. Um, so the first question um, is from Sandy. She asked, "What's your opinion on the safety of the wingtip extensions used by a few competitors that um, at the recent U.S. Nationals as well as the World Parachute Championships?" Yeah, that's an awesome question. It's uh, it's really cool. I saw. My friend Chris Geiler, uh, an Aussie, by the way, he, he lives here in SoCal with us, uh, and he was training him. My personal standpoint is I think it's any kind of, when we're dealing with experimental stuff like that, which happens a lot in wingsuiting because it's still on that experimental edge, uh, it's cool. Like, as long as we, once you're starting to put stuff like that on your suit, you need to really take a good look at the rigging uh, and make sure you're not, uh, putting yourself into a, a position that could entangle your bridle. Um, my biggest thing that when I saw them was a bridle entanglement with a rigid piece, rigid extension on our wing. Um, I think they kind of figured that one out. They're all pulling a little bit higher. Um, they're taking their due diligence to make sure that they're not going to get a bridle wrap around something rigid on a wing tip, whether it be a main or a reserve bridle. Um, but I think it's pretty cool, like advancements like that are what has created the sport. If we weren't doing stuff like that, we wouldn't be wingsuiting. So like the sport would be, wouldn't be around. So uh, I think it's cool that people are doing it. Uh, I personally haven't done it myself, but it's, uh, I'm kind of stoked to see where it goes. If eventually down the line, not to get too long winded into it, uh, there's also a wingtip pouch where we've kind of, some base jumpers have been playing around changing the placement of where the pilot chute is on the rig. Uh, more to the tip of the wing rather being in the BOC and changing the bridle routing. That's kind of once we start putting rigid extensions and kind of turning more ourselves more into hang gliders, like we're going to have to start thinking about stuff like that, but that's kind of way down the line. But yeah, I think it's awesome. I think if it's, uh, it, it's something you're probably going to see way more of in the future. Okay, thanks. We have three more questions in four minutes, so we need to keep it uh, quick. Um, another question is your advice for wingsuit exits from Cessna 182s, um, especially to advise new and inexperienced pilots. Yeah, um, yeah, I started in the Cessna. Uh, it's, it is definitely one of the harder jump platforms to exit in a wingsuit, mo mostly because it's difficult to get outside the door. I would highly recommend if to take your first flight course at a drop zone that is not a 182 drop zone. It's not maybe not possible for some people. Uh, they are very difficult to get out of in a wingsuit because we the easiest and best way to get out in a 182 in a wingsuit is to go to your back. And on a first flight course, maybe not the best uh, way of doing things. Um, so I would say recommend travel to a place that is a better aircraft. Um, if not, 
Uh, you do need to be worried about tail strikes when it comes to 182s. Make sure the pilot knows how to decelerate uh, appropriately or as best that he can so you can get out the door safely. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, next question, uh, somebody asked, as a beginner skydiver, can you please describe the best deployment process you recommend, um, if, especially if you keep on turning when you start to collapse the wings? Yeah, to, not to get too long-winded into it, but um, deployment processes should, should be a body configuration change and an angle of attack change. So we're trying to decelerate so we're trying to, to bring our angle of attack up. And then we're also trying to present our chest to the relative wind and then collapse symmetrically with our arm wings while, while bending at the leg. All of these things, it's two things at once. So it's a lot going on there. But if you're turning, when you start to collapse your wings, your angle of attack is probably low. So you probably want to bring your AOA up at that deployment time. And just keep in mind that 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 whole deployment process should take five to six to seven to eight seconds. It should not be like a, I'm reaching back to pull and that's the first step of my deployment procedure. It should be a, a couple more steps before that, which is the angle of attack change, body configuration change, and then reaching back to the BOC and deploying. Thanks, Scotty. And then the last question is, uh, can you elaborate on break-offs with vertical and horizontal separation and flare? Yeah, for sure. Uh, on some of our bigger groups, and we're talking like sometimes six people or more, uh, we really want the higher groups or what some of the vertical stacks that kind of build upwards in a way to break off earlier in altitude. So we would start, if I say had like an eight way going on, I would have my top three guys break off, say at like four or five or five. And then as the altitude gets on, they would break off vertically and horizontally so they would level the angle of attack bring that higher they would separate from the group by increasing their angle of attack and then deploying earlier before the rest of the group and watch the base with the other four guys continue on straight in that heading so it ends up kind of looking like groups splitting off at different times from the group rather than everybody breaking off all at once so it's just staging out your your break offs based on altitude and horizontal separation. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, that's, that brings us just about on, uh, on time. That's perfect, perfectly uh, 45 minutes. Um, well, you thank you very much, uh, Scotty. Thanks for all that information. There's a lot of, a uh, lot of valuable information. I've learned a lot. I'm sure we all have. Um, and uh, can I extend the offer that if anybody has any more questions that they email you or contact you directly? Absolutely. Anytime. That's what we're here for. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks for your time and getting up um, early in Sweden uh, to, um, to contribute to our virtual conference. And um, yeah, thank you very much and, and good luck with your endeavors. Thanks a bunch. Have a good one. And thanks everyone for attending and yeah, please join us in 15 minutes uh, for the next presentation.